gentlemen. As we are about to begin, I introduce myself first. My name is Nurul Nadia and it is my pleasure to be your MC this morning. Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Welcome to the AgroFood Productive Webinar on Public Health Concern in Poultry Production. So we have here Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry Tan as our moderator. Short introduction about Mr. Terry. He possesses more than 15 years of experience in the poultry industry, specializing in breeding farm management and broiler farm management. He is currently the managing director of KP Asli Sundran Berhad, a leading kampung chicken provider since 2009, and Pangkal Perdana Sundran Berhad, and a poultry feed provider. He is also the director of Sharikat Singh Longhang Breeding Farm, Sindaran Berhad, that is pioneer in the breeding of kampung chicken since the 1970s. Aside from managing his own poultry-related business, he is also contributing his experiences and skills to various industry organizations and associations. He is the current president of the Penang and Province Wellesley Farmers Association, since 2017 and the Federation of Livestock Farmers Association of Malaysia since 2019. Now, without further ado, I will pass the session to Mr. Terry Tan. Uh, hi. Uh, very good morning to all of you for being here with us today for the webinar on agro-food productive public health concerns in poultry productions, jointly organized by agro-food Productivity Nexus, AFPN, and Federation of Livestock Farmers Associations of Malaysia, FLFAM, and supported by Malaysia Productivity Corporation, MPC. I'm your moderator for today, President of FLFAM. My name is Terry Tan. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank all of you for your participation in our webinar, and also to our panel of respected speakers, Senior Assistant Director, Food Safety of Animal Section, Veterinary Public Health Division at DBS, Dr. Rohaya Binti Muhammad Ali. Technical Consultant of FLFM, Dr. Yap Teo Chong. Deputy Director of Center of Industry Relations and Networks at UPM, Professor Dr. Lo, and Technical Consultant of FLFM, Dr. Tan Chi Kiang. Today, webinar is organized with following objective. Firstly, is to di discuss the public health concerns in poultry productions, especially on food safety, antimicrobial resistance and environmental problems. Secondly, is to discuss the intervention measures for risk mitigation on public health issues. Public health concern related to poultry farming and productions have been a long-standing topic of discussions. It involves various considerations and is influenced by many factors, facts, values, and operation procedures. Thus, it is important that we hear from our knowledgeable speakers today the major public health concerns in poultry productions. In understanding poultry productions in general and these public health concerns in relevant details, we will also discuss the possible intervention measures to mitigate risk that may stem from these issues. At the end of this webinar, agro players will gain useful insights on this topic and hopefully produce this knowledge and information on their own poultry productions, operations and procedures. It is imperative that as agro players, we can better equip ourselves with the relevant discussions and information regarding poultry productions in order to progress our own business and the agriculture industry as a whole towards greater, head, towards greater heights. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Rohaya Binti Muhammad Ali, to present her topic on food safety, biological and chemical hazard in poultry farming and processing, customer and user perspective. And welcome uh, Dr. Rohaya. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Terry. 
Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Thank you uh, for inviting me to share a topic on food safety, biological and chemical hazard in poultry farming and processing customer and user perspective. Content uh, of my presentation will be an introduction, common biological and chemical hazard, roles of government on food safety, role of uh, poultry farming and processing plant, and uh, conclusion. As uh, an introduction, poultry production is one uh, of the fastest growing livestock industri industries in Malaysia. Among the major concerns related to this industry are food safety issues, threatening not only poultry production but also the customer, consumer or user. Is chicken meat and eggs uh, safe to eat? Uh, according uh, to Ministry of Health uh, statistic, uh, the number of food poisoning cases increased by 3.2% uh, in 20, uh, 2019. A total of 516 cases were recorded last year compared to 500 cases in 2018. We know not all of these cases are caused by eating chicken or eggs, but usually people will associate it with this product. Uh, usually, usually outbreak uh, of uh, food, foodborne diseases and deaths related to food handling and preparation have attracted great media attention and public focus, especially if the source of infection is from poultry product. What is uh, food safety? Food safety is a condition and practice that maintain uh, food quality to prevent contamination and foodborne diseases. As we all know, along the food chain, from farm to the fox, food safety hazard may arise and occur as they go through the supply chain. Therefore, food safety practice and procedures are implemented at every level during the preparation, handling and storage to avoid uh, this risk and harms to consumers. Are consumers concerned about food safety? Currently, food safety and quality play an important role in maintaining the health uh, of consumers. Foodborne illness can be a problem for every individual if we are all still unaware of this fact. However, over the time, consumers become more concerned about food safety the growing demands for food and high quality food in Malaysia is dr driven not only by improved living standards but also by consumer concern about food safety. Who should be responsible for food safety? The government is uh, responsible for ensuring that the public is aware of the risk in eating food and ensure that no food uh, uh, no food forces a hazard in the market. The industry, on the other hand, is responsible for controlling the exposure of contaminants and material added uh, to their products. The customer and consumers are also responsible for food safety by changing their attitudes uh, to raise awareness about food safety.
customers expectation uh, as uh, we all know customers and consumers have the right to expect the food they buy and consume are safe high quality nutritious and valuable they have the right to have uh, opinion on food standards microbi microbiological and chemical hazard control procedures and practices used used by government and industries to ensure that food supplies have these safety features. Food safety hazard, there are uh, three types of hazard that we need to consider, bi biological, chemical, and physical. Bio biological hazard are pathogenic <coughs> organism includes bacteria, uh, viruses and parasites. They can develop, develop in fully handle food or through contamination from an outside source. <coughs> Chemical hazard, hazards are harmful substance, substance such as pesticide, machine oil, mycotoxins, natural toxins, environmental contaminant, food additive, Processing induced chemical, pesticide, or agriculture products and veterinary drug residue. This hazard <coughs> are present. <coughs> sorry. This hazard are present at every stage of food uh, to human. <coughs> Physical uh, hazard are uh, object objects with uh, which uh, contaminate uh, food such as pieces of glass or metal, toothpicks, jewelry or hair. Care should be taken uh, during the preparation process in order to reduce the, the risk of contamination. <coughs> Com uh, now I move to uh, uh, next slide, common biological and chemical hazard. Uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, presentation, I will or emphasize on these two uh, bi biological and chemical hazard. So, so, so um, organism uh, indicator are one of the categories of uh, bio bio biological hazard that uh, indicate the clean, clean, cleanliness or hygiene of the factory or premises. The, the indicator uh, are TPC, Coliform, E. coli, and step aureus. Can, uh, uh, cannot, cannot be exit uh, the standard limit. This is the standard limit for each um, organism indicator. For uh, uh, common food uh, bond pathogen, this is another category of biological hazard. Salmonella, Campylobacter, and uh, Listeria monocytogen cytogen are among the most common <coughs> foodborne pathogens. Source of salmonellosis includes eggs and poultry meat through vertical and lateral uh, transmission. All foodborne pathogens are expected to be zero as any food product are tested. So for, <clears throat> for veterinary drug uh, residue and uh, MR, chemical hazards could uh, potentially be introduced throughout the chain and end up in poultry meat or eggs. One of the chemical hazards is a residue of veterinary banned uh, drug and control drugs. Veterinary banned drugs are strictly pro prohibited drugs that use uh, for their use in uh, livestock and are not allowed to contain any such uh, drug residues in livestock products such as uh, beta agonist, uh, nitrofuran, and chlorampenicol. Veterinary uh, control drug residues monitored as maximum residual, limit, residual limits can be found in animal meat and other food products due to excessive use of antimicrobial in veterinary practice. 
any food with uh, an uh, antimicrobial, an antimicrobial residue under MRL should be safe to eat, but it is important to remember that to remain the limit as lower as possible. Uh, whereas antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance, MR is also a food uh, safety problem. Resistant common cell bacteria such as uh, E. coli and pathogenic bacteria such as Salmonella also pose a risk as they can carry res resistant genes that uh, can be further transferred to human pathogen. The development and spread of uh, resistant to this agent following their use and misuse of antibiotic in animal production. So uh, the government, uh, DBS, as well as MOH play an important role in food uh, safety through the develop development of food safety action rule and procedures. Among the acts and regulation are the Ministerial Function Act 1999, Animal Act 1953, Food Act 1983, Poison Act 1952, Food Regulation 1985, and uh, Animal Feed uh, Act 2009. Uh, we also have uh, procedures and guidelines such as APTVM and uh, PVM while internationally uh, we also have CODEX, WHO, FAO and OIE gu uh, guidelines for reference. <clears throat> uh, I would like to share about the uh, Veterinary Public Health uh, Index Management and Monitoring um, uh, this uh, VPH index management and monitoring are among the function and activities uh, carried out by DVS under the Veterinary Public Health Division. So this program involves sampling at a slaughterhouse, abattoirs, processing plant and farms. All sample taken will be sent and tested in uh, veterinary Public Health uh, Laboratory in Salat Tinggi. Any violation that uh, occur will be registered as Veterinary Public Health or KAV Index. Veterinary uh, Public Health Index Management uh, is implemented to ensure corrective uh, action is taken by the processing plant, abattoir and farm is uh, correct and consistent. Veterinary, uh, veterinary Public Health Index Management is uh, to coordinate and monitor the contamination of biological substance, chemicals, residues, and foodborne diseases from entering the food chains chain through uh, animal product. In addition, it is to prevent and minimize the spread of a foodborne illness as well as to reduce the risk of drug residue for uh, veterinary control uh, drug lab in uh, MRL, prevent the use of banned drug and uh, antibiotic in animal products. So, so the uh, veterinary public health index is managed according to the color coded, which is red, yellow, and green that uh, differentiate the action at e each uh, level. As soon as a uh, uh, veterinary index is registered uh, through confirmation by laboratory res result, we will give a red color code coded. Yellow indicates corrective action has been taken uh, by the plant, slaughterhouse or farms. After that, if the department is satisfied with the corrective action made by the plan with the negative uh, laboratory result, the index will change to green. This means uh, corrective and preventive active uh, was taken correctly by, by them. This slide uh, 
shows the veterinary public health uh, index for 2016 until October 2020. The pattern is slightly increasing uh, each year compared, compared to the set, uh, our set target, which is uh, below 2%. This slide, uh, this slide uh, shows the veterinary public health index by species of a producing animal and we can see here the index, index in uh, poultry. It's higher, this is a poultry, it's higher uh, if compared to other species. The uh, veterinary, uh, this, this slide shows uh, VPH index cases, sanitation and hygiene for poultry processing plant. We can see here uh, the index was higher, suddenly higher in 2000, uh, 2020 compared to previous years. So this is a uh, 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 veterinary public health index cases for salmonella species and compilobacter in poultry and poultry products. Uh, the index uh, case pattern uh, for salmonella is uh, fluctuating while uh, compilobacter is uh, increasing. So, uh, if you can see here, the case of uh, banned drug detection uh, uh, in poultry product uh, higher in 2016. After that, uh, there is uh, no cases until, until now, 2020. And most of the drug uh, detected uh, is uh, nitrofuran. Uh, for the uh, veterinary public health index cases of control drug detected uh, in uh, poultry product almost every year, there are cases detected uh, where tetracycline and uh, fluoroquinolone are the most uh, frequent. Uh, this slide show, shows uh, anti antibiotic sensitivity pattern in layer. Uh, there are, um, as we can see here, uh, the, the slide shows resistance of uh, Salmonella and E. coli. Higher, in, uh, higher for ampicillin, chlorampenicol, tetracycline, yeah, tetracycline. And uh, for E. coli, the same drug, uh, uh, resi uh, the same drug uh, uh, for the uh, E. coli resistant, uh, higher for ampicillin, chlorpenicol, tetracycline. This one, that one is in la layer. Here is uh, in a broiler, the anti anti antibiotic sensitivity pattern in broiler. Also uh, show the same uh, pattern of uh, resistance to ampicillin, chlorampenicol, and tetracycline. And, and also the trimetoprim for both uh, E. coli and salmonella in broiler. So here, uh, in a processing plant from the chicken meat uh, also shows the, the, the same uh, pattern. We can see uh, resistance of salmonella and uh, E. coli uh, higher 
for ampicillin, chlorpenicol, tetracycline. Yeah, all uh, all um, uh, in layer broiler and processing plant uh, shows the re re resistant to uh, ampicillin, trimetoprim, chlorpenicol, and tetracycline. So in uh, uh, in this slide. Uh, for the role of uh, poultry farming and processing plant in food safety, in poultry control in, in poultry farm uh, control for biological and chemical should be at the farm level because of the source of uh, contamination. This uh, practice should uh, be based on good animal husbandry practice, good hygiene. May, uh, good hygiene uh, measures for poultry houses, environment, equipment, and feed hygiene. Good uh, biosecurity practice, animal welfare, good vector control, good animal health uh, practice, vaccination, and also vaccination. It is good if this uh, is uh, is the farm has might get certification for from DBS to gain uh, customer confidence. For the well, the for the processing plan, there is a need uh, a need for the implementation uh, implementation of HACCP or GMP. It is uh, also good uh, if the processing plan uh, has the veterinary health mark certification from the DBS. So for the, con uh, in conclusion, uh, against good uh, animal husbandry and strict uh, biosecurity measures are a pre prerequisite for poultry farm uh, food safety. Meanwhile, in the processing plant, bio biological and chemical hazards can be prevented by controlling the quality raw material that enter the production process area and has a good maintenance of the equipment. The government needs to enforce the uh, standard for both industries and consumers. The consumers, uh, they themselves have an important role to play in reducing the risk of hazard. Safe food handling by consumer in household must be considered to be last line of uh, defense. Last line of defense. Therefore, uh, they should have knowledge in food safety, food related disease, and be applied in practice. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohaya. Dr. Yap Tio Chong our technical consultant of FLFAM to present his topic on environmental concerns in the poultry industry. And uh, this time I, won't, I will not miss it uh, because everyone is familiar with uh, Dr. Yap that I, I guess every time I have seen your face right in this webinar and the whole series. And <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, we, we are glad to, to have you here, Dr. Yap. And you are an experienced guy, and uh, you you can uh, hopefully that you can pass all your experience to share to share your experience with the floor. And uh, we go to the his profile. He is a veterinarian graduate from the University of Melbourne in 1972. His postgraduate study include uh, diploma on food hygiene and veterinary public health from the Royal Agriculture University, Copenhagen, and a master degree from uh, Murdoch University, Australia, West. Australia. He has worked in the Department of Veterinary Services for 14 years, 20 years in Malaysia poultry industry, and 10 years with WHO and FO, FAO as an international expert on AI and food safety risk mitigation in poultry supply chains in various countries. Currently, he is now a technical consultant of FAFM. And uh, by looking at uh, his profile, that we know that he is very experienced, uh, 14 years, 20 years in Malaysia poultry industry. And uh, thank you to have you here. And Dr. Yap, the floor is yours. Well, <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Terry Tan, our moderator for this morning. And um, I think we've heard 
uh, Dr. Raya talk about the food safety aspects as a, one of the public health concerns of, uh, in the poultry industry. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, the environmental concerns uh, as another part of uh, public health concerns in the poultry industry. Now, I think uh, this, this is uh, an important issue and uh, let me go straight into it. Now, the things that I'm going to talk about um, today, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the factors that contributed uh, to the environmental concerns. Uh, what are the primary concerns from the various sector like the farm and hatchery, the slaughterhouse or egg processing plants, and the impact that this, uh, this problem, uh, this risk come, uh, bring about to, to, the, to, the, to the public as well as to the environment. I'll mention a little bit about some of the legislations or regulations governing the poultry industry, particularly those that are concerning environmental control. And with that, I'll move into general strategies and sustainable measures for risk mitigation and environmental pollution and, uh, and go into some specific focus for some of the risk mitigation measures. All right, that, that is uh, the order of my presentation this morning. Now let's look at um, the first one that I'm going to talk about, which is, as I mentioned, the factors contributing to environmental concerns. Um, one of the factors is, of course, as you know, uh, our country is a growing country and uh, we have a lot of rapid urbanization. So what was once a remote, uh, what was once a remote area for poultry farming are now very close to housing or commercial projects. So uh, when we previously, when the farmer previously set up the farm, uh, there was no neighbors around, but today things are different. So this has brought about now the closeness between the people, the residents and the farm. And uh, that's where sometimes you get a complaints coming in. And the other thing is, of course, uh, we have to make sure that the products are uh, readily available in the market. They are also at affordable places. So there is a certain amount of intensification of poultry farming in order to bring about uh, economy of scale and therefore keep the prices affordable. And of course, uh, the adoption of new technology. Now. Another area that has happened with this uh, trying to be close to the market and close to the uh, um, making it affordable uh, is of course, many of farms are now in cluster areas, especially along the west coast uh, of Peninsula Malaysia. And uh, because it is not easy to find land that is uh, suitable and approved for uh, poultry production. So whatever land that is available, everybody flock there, yeah? So hence, you get a cluster of this kind of poultry farms. The third thing is because uh, the farms have to consider uh, the logistic uh, of uh, taking the product to market. And I think this is where um, you possibly you can get very remote areas for farming uh, in the east coast of Malaysia, uh, Pahang or something like that. But then uh, the cost for taking the product from farm to the market will be prohibitive. And that is very difficult then to comply with the government's objective of keeping uh, protein, uh, poultry especially, and an affordable price for the consumer. So this is a logistic requirement, is uh, in, therefore in itself a guiding factor as to how the farms, where the farms, are to establish vis-a-vis, -vis, I mentioned about urbanization as a conflicting uh, factor. Now, the other thing, of course, is labor, labor availability. Now, if you are in a remote area, the labor labor's availability may be not so simple because um, the poultry farming uh, and even poultry processing uh, fall into the category of the three Ds. Uh, dangerous, dirty, and difficult. Um, 
and I think that the, the, the last factor that I want to mention uh, is I think currently uh, we are still not getting uh, quick enough uh, government support and incentives for the, the, the ability to enable the, the poultry industry to resolve some of these issues. I, I will go into that a little bit uh, further afterwards. Now, I'm going to talk about the primary concerns and the disturbances uh, uh, that uh, come from the poultry industry. And I think, uh, let's talk about farms and hatcheries first, then later on we'll talk about uh, processing plants. Now, the first thing that comes to uh, many people's mind when they hear about a poultry farm is the fly nuisance. Next, the rodents. These are, of course, in poorly managed uh, poultry farms. And of course, uh, the smell, the odor coming in from the uh, farms, uh, especially to the um, immediate neighbors. And of course, uh, there are also emissions of uh, dust, organic debris, and the endotoxin plumes expelled from the poultry houses. Now, the other thing, of course, uh, not only the flies and the odor, uh, some farms and poorly managed farms, the untreated solid waste. And by that, I mean the poultry dung or the, the bedding or litter, the sick and dead, dead birds. Now, if these are not disposed of uh, carefully, properly in the right manner, then of course, it will cause a problem. You, you, you attract the flies and you, you create a lot of foul smell uh, in these kind of farms. And the, the, the another thing is, of course, uh, once in a while, you need to do cleaning and sanitation in some of these farms. And if this water is not treated properly at the farm level or at hatchery and just discharged into the environment, then we also can cause a problem. So these are some of the environmental problems that are created by poorly managed farms. I emphasize poorly managed farms. The, of course, it's not um, not evidence so much in the well managed farms. Now, besides environment, the 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 in, intra uh, premise environment that, that talking about just now I thought talking about external environment, not intra environment, and that is the environment inside the the half farms or it can also be a hazard, and particularly to the to the workers working in there. So it creates what we term as occupational health hazards. And this is something that uh, uh, the, the, the management of farms must uh, take into consideration and uh, with, uh, take the right uh, precautions or risk mitigation measures. Of course, the discharge of pathogens to the environment uh, can also spread the pathogens as well as antimicrobial resistance to uh, the environment and hence to the humans. I think this is... Um, something that um, not only we are discharging uh, untreated waste, which contaminate the river ways or, or the waterways, uh, but by spreading the pathogen into the environment and then also carrying, carrying with it the antimicrobial resistance with it, it also creates another hazard uh, of public health concern. Now, let's move on to slaughterhouse. And in, in the slaughterhouse, um, we have many byproducts. Now, if a poor management of byproducts, what do you mean byproducts? These are maybe dead poultry. Sometimes when a truck load of uh, a lorry load of uh, live poultry coming into the slaughterhouse, you get some that uh, may have died on the way due to heat stress, etc. And this is called uh, dead on arrival or dead poultry, just, just to be simple about it. And of course, when you slaughter the, 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 the poultry, there will be residues like uh, or byproducts like blood, bones, feathers, and of course in the egg processing plant you have eggshell, the egg contents, and uh, the poultry dung of course from the uh, 
from the larynx, that means the, the life where the live birds are kept before slaughter in the slaughterhouse. Now the indiscriminate disposal of all these uh, byproducts will cause environmental contamination. Just as uh, indiscriminate uh, feeding of the raw poultry offal uh, for aquaculture is also an, an, an avenue for polluting the environment. Now, in the slaughterhouse, there is also at the end of the day, or even in the egg processing plant, you always use chemicals, disinfectants for cleaning and, and sanitation after the day's work is done. And this water, if just discharged into the waterways, it's also an issue. Now, so some of the things that are very important, uh, of course, that comes up from the wastewater treatment plant uh, would be the sludge as well as the wastewater discharge, which must, of course, comply with environmental quality acts. And the odor can also, in the render, can also come from the slaughterhouse, particularly. Uh, from the wastewater treatment plant or from the rendering if the if the plant is the slaughterhouse is doing rendering uh, rendering is the conversion of the byproduct into offal meal or feather meal and just as i what i mentioned about in the farms where the intra uh, facility environment can be a health concern the intra uh, environment uh, in the slaughterhouse can also be an occupational health hazard to the workers. And of course, as I mentioned just now, the discharge of microbes or microbials into the environment and transmission of uh, AMR, uh, that's antimicrobial resistance, to the humans, to the, to the environment, and hence to the human. It can happen in the farms. It can also happen in the slaughterhouse. Now, so the environmental impacts, environmental impacts of all this uh, uh, mismanagement will result in flies and rodents, creating nuisance and health hazards to the neighbor. Uh, eutrophication, which is uh, because uh, a lot of this discharge are very rich in nutrients and uh, that will cause the plant growth. So even when you do have uh, a pond, a high water hyacinth pond, uh, but the very rich growth will encourage the uh, growth of the uh, algae or the, or the hyacinth or the hyacinth. Uh, and when this uh, growth is too much uh, in, in, not in proportion with the size of the lagoon, then you get uh, this decay or, or the dying of the plants and that will cause a deprivation uh, of the oxygen in the ponds or in the canal or waterways and thereby killing all animal life in the in this uh, rivers and waterway and that by itself will create an odor in the waterways now of course um, the health hazards of feeding raw poultry i've already talked about it it's something that needs to be addressed and i think um, this is something that uh, particularly in the smaller plants smaller slaughterhouses that do not have rendering facilities and that they are not taking good management of it, that one easy way is to sell the raw poultry for aquaculture. And that is something to look at. The, the occupational health uh, hazards, I think again, uh, this is an impact. That means we can have salmonella uh, transfer from the, the product or the live poultry or the dress poultry to the workers uh, are working in the slaughterhouse. And of course, uh, in a worse situation, um, where it, not in fortunately not in our Malaysia, but in other countries, in our neighbors, where there is a highly pathogenic avian influenza exists, um, you can get this uh, avian influenza virus transmitted from the birds or the, the poultry carcasses during the evisceration to the human workers to the to the workers and thereby causing positive cases of HPAI in factories. Incidentally, this is evident also in uh, COVID-19. Now, some of the um, manure that uh, 
this this slide just give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem uh, and i think uh, so there is a substantial uh, manure coming out uh, from farms uh, whether you're talking about a layer or a broiler because uh, the manure has to come out from the chicken and therefore it has a certain amount that has to be taken care of uh, there are of course other uh, products uh, uh, environmental uh, criteria that you have to look at BOD, COD, ammonical nitrogen which causes a lot of older problem as well as some of the uh, uh, Indicate food in food in, uh, indicator organisms as Dr. Rohaya mentioned about coliforms and uh, strepto, uh, streptococci or even staphylococci. Now the the Environmental Quality Act actually gives you certain standards, uh, whether it's standard A or standard B, depending on where the slaughterhouse is, uh, whether you're in the water catchment area or in a non-water catchment area, then it's standard B. Now you'll see that the BOD at 20 degrees Celsius uh, for standard A is a very low. It has to be 20 for compliance, 50 for standard B, and the COD is 50 and 100 uh, A and B respectively. So I think oil and grease is not tolerated. And uh, in standard A, it, has not, it cannot be detected. And in standard, standard B, it has to be 10 milligram per liter or less. I think these are some of the uh, Environmental Quality Act, uh, especially in the Swedish industrial effluent, spell out very clearly uh, what the parameters that has to be where slaughterhouse have to have compliance with. Now, so these are some of the gov uh, regulations, legislative regulations governing the poultry industry. Of course, the Animal Act by itself, 1953, that was revised in 2006. This will then uh, work uh, cover uh, notifiable diseases, movement of animals, and so um, how how do one uh, reduce the health hazards, for instance? Uh, and this is covered in the Animal Act. We, we if if uh, an AI were to happen, then it's a notifiable disease, and strict action has to be taken. I think this was covered in a previous webinar. Therefore, I will not go into it. I think the Feed Act also is important. This will get another act. Uh, the animal, of course, the Animal Act is under the jurisdiction on the Department of Veterinary Services under the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry. Feed Act is also uh, under the jurisdiction of the Department of Veterinary Services and in the uh, MAFI. The Poisons Act is something that uh, is in the Ministry of Health, a very long standing. Uh, uh, act and that governs what can be imported and what cannot be imported and what can be uh, classified as uh, only for human or what for can animals. So I think this is where something that uh, veterinarians and uh, livestock feeders, uh, breeders have to take note of. The Food Act of course um, is very important because it, it actually um, t t tells you what are the uh, product that, um, and I think Rohaya, Dr. Rohaya mentioned some of them already, uh, permissible, not permissible, and the MRL, the what they call uh, maximum residue levels. These are all spelled out in the Food Act and its regulations. The Environmental Quality Act 1974 and the Civic Industrial Regulations 1979, these two are very, this, this, this act is very important for all farms as well as for slaughterhouses as well as egg processing plants, hatcheries, because you must comply with this. Failing which uh, it can be taken, uh, that, that particular establishment can be taken to court uh, or even a stop, stop work order. Now, there are a few um, um, acts in the, in the, in the, in the, in the government, uh, government legislations that the animal industry, uh, the poultry industry has to take cognizance of to recognize that, and these are the local government act, the town council, country planning act, the national land code. I will talk a little bit about this one afterwards because it affects the conversion of uh, open house to closed house system. Now, the control of supply act and the price control anti profiteering act, competition act, this come under the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, whereby um, 
we the, the government try to keep track of the uh, of the industry and make sure that we produce a, a, a product that is affordable that is uh, commonly available in the marketplace now yeah i was telling you that there, there is something that we should talk about and that is conversion of open house to closed house system remember we talked about the uh, the fly nuisance and the older nuisance from the uh, farms and i think um, in practice the industry and the government recognizes that if the farms are able to move from open sided houses to closed sided houses you will be able to uh, reduce um, the the fly problem as well as the odor problem and uh, of course uh, it also has to come hand in hand with also uh, improving the um, hygiene and sanitation in these houses and these houses also gives you better productivity as well as give you um, better uh, worker efficiency so i think i think um, it's certainly an, uh, something to move forward but unfortunately um, we have some problems here of trying to move from open house to closed house i'm not going to dwell too much about this this is another topic but just to mention that this um, require a lot of uh, uh, work together between the government and the uh, private sector that means the poultry industry because uh, we have actually basically three three laws that govern the uh, conversion from open to closed house the national land code which got ta uh, talked about the uh, agriculture uh, agriculture land and there says that no no permanent building are permitted and also you have to tuka sharat nyata from agriculture to poultry farming or livestock farming in order to do livestock farming this is something that again something to be addressed the town and country planning act says that you must have a kebenaran uh, planning approval or in bahasa kebenaran merancang and uh, again that is an obstacle that needs to be uh, looked at uh, there are many issues on that which i think uh, will be covered by another webinar down the road. And of course, under the, the Street and Drainage and Building Act, it says that only uh, permanent buildings can be on industrial land. So this, you see, well, I think it's such a good move to go from open house to closed house. But uh, today, only about 31% of uh, these uh, poultry farms are in the closed house sector. And they're largely in the South uh, where uh, many of the farms are exporting to Singapore and that's one of the uh, uh, export requirement. So, but elsewhere it's slow moving. And I think this is something that in order to decrease the fly and odor problem, we need to really uh, upstem the conversion. In other words, we need, as I mentioned just now, we need government support in rationalizing some of the government policies and legislations. Now, um, I, okay, I've dealt with the uh, housing, the, the open house, closed house. But I think there are a couple of other things that we have to look at. I think the uh, flock health management, especially on the biosecurity and biocontainment, these are very important so that we uh, decrease the mortality. Uh, I said mortality means uh, the birds dying, and sometimes the farmer just leave it, leave it by the roadside or leave it for some uh, rubbish collector to come and collect. Uh, some uh, some person who enterprise enough to come and collect the dead birds and that actually causes uh, an, expo over, uh, an exposure that that brings about flies and and odor po pollution as well and i also said mentioned about uh, to decrease amr and i think probably prof law later will talk more about this um, i think we also need to in order to make sure that we have a proper system of uh, of uh, management in our farms or in our poultry pr uh, processing plant or hatcheries or our feed mill as well as in the uh, egg processing plant we should encourage of course the quality management systems and i think uh, one that is uh, uh, advocated and promoted by the department of services veterinary services is mind gap and i think this is something that uh, it has to be promoted more 
and it has to make it a little bit more attractive for uh, farmers to adopt. And of course, uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Rohaya mentioned about the VHM logo plants, uh, whereby you have, must have good manufacturing practices and hazard analysis of critical control points. You must use the services from uh, accredited food safety lab. And he, she mentioned, Dr. Rohaya mentioned about the lab in Salat Tinggi. But of course, there are other labs as well. Now, I think the other important point is the uh, waste minimization, the strategy on waste minimization, resource recovery, and uh, proper waste management. Now, the waste management is not just at the uh, farm level or at the plant level. It has to be all along the poultry supply chain. Now, some general principles on, on, on uh, sustainable waste management. I think the first thing is to try and avoid the generation of uh, waste to reduce, uh, remove and reduce all the waste. And of course, is to re reuse or recycle uh, some of the, 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 the things that we have and uh, recover. So we talk about, uh, just now I mentioned about rendering in the poultry processing plants. And you are basically uh, taking something that is potentially a, a hazard to uh, a waste pollutant to the environment. You convert it into some useful product, such as an offal meal or a feather meal, and uh, that can be recycled back into uh, livestock nutrition. And of course, uh, the treatment of the wastewater that must be properly uh, uh, managed and regulated so that you do not pollute the waterways. And uh, of course, the disposal of any sludge or any solid waste. Uh, this must also again be properly treated. Now let's move down to some specific focus for sustainable waste management. I think the first thing might be to look at the nutrition and feeding strategies. And I think the, this is where uh, we, we need to get the um, nutritionists to have a look at it and uh, to formulate uh, what is called uh, an efficient diet, uh, whether you want to uh, different phase of the rearing of the poultry require different phases of the of the diet of the of the requirement, so that you are close to to um, to the needs and the biological needs of the of the poultry. This way, we don't want wastage. We don't want ex excessive uh, slowing down uh, or too fast a growth. So we want. Uh, ngam ngam, uh, to be accurate in our formulation to, 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 to up to the genetic potential. Don't go over that, but don't go too far underneath. And this are uh, information readily available from the breed companies. And uh, improve the digest digestibility utilization. That not only uh, reduces waste, but it also actually improves your FCR, the feed conversion ratio. And I think you also go, go on to look at the gut health. I mentioned about you know, the importance of flock health. And I think you, you have to look at uh, how you manage the gut health because that way uh, we can control the excretion of pathogenic bacteria and use uh, less usage of an antimicrobial, uh, antimicrobials, especially antibiotics, and therefore creating less um, AMR, less antimicrobial resistance. And I think, of course, uh, there are alternatives, uh, alternatives uh, to the use of uh, antibiotics, uh, probiotics, and I think I won't talk about anything of that because I think Prof. Lo will, will probably talk more about that. And then to fit technology, this is also important. Uh, in order to not waste our feed, make sure that the, the feed processing are uh, using good quality ingredients so that we don't have mycotoxin because mycotoxin is going to cause a lot, causes diarrhea in the poultry, and that uh, it'll bring about uh, a very wet litter or wet feces, and that's going to attract flies. That's going to attract flies, and, and that also the odor. And uh, the feed processing, the pelleting process must be done properly, otherwise you will not kill the pathogens, uh, if pathogens exist in, in some of the raw material for the feed. And also, if the pellets crumble too easily, then the chicken can't pick it up, then there's going to be a lot of wastage on this. So I think these are, are some of the things that uh, 
in the nutrition and the feeding strategies uh, we must look at. Of course, at the farm itself, there are many ways that you can try to uh, reduce some of the, uh, the risk, what you call risk mitigation measures. And I think, for instance, the contact of the manure and uh, that means the, the, the feces, yeah? the dung from the, uh, reduce the contact or reduce the carcass. I mentioned to you that you can get uh, birds dying in the farm even on a daily basis. And how do you dispose of these carcasses uh, not exposed to the air? And I think that we should bring about flies, we should bring about odor. And so you have to reduce this kind of uh, contact with the air. The ventilation in a poultry house, particularly, and this is achievable in closed houses, whereby you lower the, uh, the manure, the little moisture. I don't think this is important. And of course, uh, general housekeeping uh, of the farm compound and uh, your refuse management, this will all help to reduce your fly problem, rodent problem particularly, uh, wind breakers, especially in the buffer zones that will help uh, reduce the spread of the odor. Now, coming to flies and insects uh, on, and rats, uh, there are, of course, many measures. Um, I think uh, one, of the, one of the key thing is to reduce the breeding grounds, right? So you have to have a proper uh, housekeeping uh, practices. Uh, I mentioned just now about feed spillage and feed wastage, and also, the, the feed storage, whether you are keeping it in, in a storeroom uh, or a bin, make sure they are properly uh, in a closed bin. Uh, prop, uh, feed store must be uh, well controlled. And of course, um, in, in an open, if it's a house, an open house, make sure that your, your netting and your house integrity must be good. Even in a closed house, the, the, the integrity of the, uh, of the curtains or the panels must be good. Otherwise, uh, flies and uh, rats will get in there. And um, ventilation management, this is talked about by Dr. David Cho earlier on in one of the webinars. And I think if you don't do that, you also get into a lot of problems. So I think um, this baiting, of course, are very commonly practices, but it has to be integrated in a, not just use baiting with insecticides or rodenticides by itself. I think that everything's all right, but it has to be integrated with the rest of the risk management. Now, so I think the um, a little bit more on the on the farms composting, uh, whether sometimes we use bacteria, enzymes, uh, the manure recycling, then you composting and churning, turning from the uh, manure, the dung into a fertilizer. Uh, the roof and surface water runoff, I think this is again, uh, something to, to think about because, um, that is uh, by itself, the uh, roof and surface water runoff is by itself a clean water. So I think it should not be going into any one of the, the waste discharge pond so as to contaminate it and then try to release that. I think that you then have to treat a larger volume of wastewater. And I, I mentioned that for, uh, in the pyramid, the hierarchy, you have to reduce your waste in order to manage it properly. So if you don't have uh, a proper segregation of uh, roof and surface water runoff from your actual cleaning and sanitation water, then you have to end up treating more and that is wasteful. I think in the, in the, in the case of um, the, um, the hatchery waste, of course, you have the fluff, you have the eggshells, and uh, I think this is something that some some in some countries they do a, a extrusion on the eggshell and to reduce the and rather than uh, trying to uh, dispose of the eggshells in a, what they call landfill uh, area. Now in the slaughterhouse, of course, you have um, water coming from the various uh, floor, and then this has to go through your wastewater treatment, and then the sludge that comes out from the wastewater treatment has to be dewatered so that it can be uh, removed correctly. I mentioned something about rendering so that you can convert, but this is not done in every every slaughterhouse. Uh, this is done more in the larger slaughterhouses. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, in our country, we still have a very wide spectrum 
of slaughterhouses. Uh, some very small slaughterhouse. Uh, these are largely uh, under the jurisdiction on the municipal council. And they might slaughter only 2,000 or 1,000 birds per day. Uh, they, of course, would not be, they cannot afford to have a rendering plant. But of course, in the bigger uh, poultry slaughterhouses, those that are with the VHM logo, they would have a rendering plant. And then they can convert all these poultry byproducts to feather, blood, or offal meal. And I think the other thing, of course, uh, I already mentioned that perhaps we have to reduce and optimize energy consumption. Uh, so I think uh, that's, I think, the time permitting for me. Um, I've covered the areas that I should cover in this particular topic. Now I'd like to hand, it, hand the mic back to Mr. Terry Tan. We will welcome our third speaker, an honorable panelist today is Professor Dr. Lo TC. He will be speaking on use of non antimicrobial alternative in a sustainable productions. Dr. Lo, Professor Lo Tech Chun is a professor at the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Putra, Malaysia. He holds a PhD degree from the University of London, UK. His research interests include animal feed additive and the nutritional requirements of animal. Dr. Lowe was the president of the Society of Asian Australia, Australia, Australasian Animal Productions 2016-2018, Malaysia Society of Animal Productions 2018-2018. Early in 2017 to date, the research council of the UK invite him, invited him as a panel member. Now he is serving as one of the colleague members for UKRI. He is also the panel for the Institute of Animal Science and Veterinary Medicine, Fujian Academic of Agriculture Science, China. Uh, welcome, Prof. Lo to be here today. And the floor is yours, Professor Lo. All right, first of all, I would like to thank um, Agrofood Productivity Nessus of MPC and FL, FM, FAM that uh, inviting me, I mean, to come over to this webinar and then try to share about the topic on the use of non uh, antimicrobial growth promoter alternative in sustainable poultry production. And I would like to emphasize on non antimicrobial growth promoter because this antimicrobial sometimes mislead the people and it can be used as treatment and it also can be used as growth promoter. As we know that uh, for the poultry uh, and livestock industry, they are the most dynamic and ever expanding segment of the globalized industry. If, if we look at what the population growth, for example, like this one, and then an urbanization of our city and income growth. And we know that this is the, what, the driving force for enormous development of world livestock sector growing at an extraordinary rate. If we look at what the uh, uh, increase of the, what, the global demand of the meat, especially we, we look at it as a whole, for the whole population uh, in the world, as well as to, uh, the meat consuming population. It has been projected our meat consumption uh, will be increased tremendously. And it also has been projected uh, by the, I'm sorry. It also has been projected in year 1997, uh, we, we will produce about 220 million tons and it will increase up to 380 million tons by year 2030. And the reason because of this, because of the what, as I mentioned, because of the what factors that I, I shared with you just now. And then this will make the what, the meat more affordable throughout the world and due to the what, income growth of the world. 
And if we look at what the urbanization, we, we know that, I mean, there's quite a tremendous improvement in terms of infrastructure, including the cold chain, making trade of perishable goods more possible. Therefore, we need to have a very intensified production system. Thus, there are many challenges that we are facing now today. One of them is animal health and growth performance. As we know that the, the most, I mean, common approach that we normally, I mean, find it in a farm, for example, like use of feed additive to promote cook growth. And we, we know it, especially for the, the um, uh, AGP, antimicrobial growth promoter, normally we, we always give them in a low uh, dosage. The reason because of this is to improve the animal health and growth performance. And most of the time, this, I mean, the use of this feed additive is meant for growth promoting. And normally AGP at low doses, they will enhance the weight gain and improve the health of the animals. And quality production. And from the history, we know it, it, AGP has been used it 60 years ago. And then we have been observing this kind of the one, the growth performance, especially it will enhance the growth in poultry and livestock. And the most commonly used antibiotic such as, or antimicrobial, such as bacitracin, manganese, neomycin, sulfuramycin, tetracycline, and penicillin, and many more. Therefore, in order to overcome this kind of problem, uh, the excessive use of this uh, AGP, we, we need to have to have alternative, especially for a good AGP alternative. And then this alternative is to improve the growth of the animals. And furthermore, they should reduce the incidence and severity of the subclinical infection, reduction in microbial use of nutrients. And furthermore, it will improve the absorption of the nutrients. Uh, it has been also reported that we need to reduce what the growth depressing double lines that produced by gram positive bacteria, as reported by many uh, papers. AGP at a lower dose, it will improve the, what, the weight gain, as I mentioned just now, and then it has been widely used. And what are the alternative feed additives that are commonly available, especially in the market now today, in order to have this uh, uh, replacement of this AGP? For example, like probiotic, postbiotic, and prebiotic, acidifier, phytogenic compound, bacteriophage, medium chain triacylglycerol, and even some of the, what, the people they uh, claim that synthetic amino acids are uh, one of the alternatives that we can look for. Today, I would like to share, I mean, the first four topics, probiotic, postbiotic, prebiotic, acidifier, phytogenic compound, as well as bacteriophage. And application for this um, postbiotic, okay, it has been known uh, for, for many years and these probiotic cultures have been exploited extensively in pharmaceutical food and feed industry. And probiotic culture is not a multitasking and could not meet the properties required by every industry. And the, the, the thing is, they still, I mean, have I mean, a, a huge increment demand of new probiotic culture that's specific to each functionality. The challenge that we use, I mean, probiotic viable cells, I believe a lot of people, they know it, especially those, I mean, farmers in a farm, they find out sometimes when they use this probiotic, they may not get, I mean, satisfied results as, 
as they wanted. And I, I, I need to remind everybody, different viability of the probiotic species in the product or in a feed, they have different functionality. And sometimes we have to meet the numbers or the population that require in order to show this kind of functionality of this probiotic. In addition to that, there's a very high maintenance cost, I mean, to ensure viability of this probiotic, for example, like storage, handling, etc. And sometimes some of the, what the, um, some of the user, they all, always find out, okay, something like pro-inflammatory response in the host with inflamed gut. And furthermore, I mean, there's one report, uh, some of the, I mean, lactic acid bacteria, which is also known as, as probiotic, they, they may get something like the what? Antibiotic resi resistant gene transfer from some other microbes. And this result, just to show you uh, a test that been carried out for the lactic acid bacteria, bacteria that isolated from the chicken feces and we found out okay let the S bacteria are resistant to wide range of the antibiotic such as nalidisi acid, bacitracin, gentamicin, uh, saprofloxacin and sulfur metosazole and canamycin as well as the, what, the streptomycin and a, a, a very I mean, they are not very sensitive to vancomycin as well. I, I would like to share with you about the, what, the uh, timeline, uh, especially related to this lactic acid bacteria. And then probably too many people, I mean, have, I mean, have been using this probiotic. Therefore, I think this is timely for us, I mean, to explore more. If you look at what the timeline of this um, lactic acid bacteria, from probiotic to prebiotic. And I need to remind everybody, prebiotic is not microbes. They are just only oligosaccharide. They are non-digestible fiber. And paraprobiotic, postbiotic, and cytobiotic. Uh, don't get frightened with this terminology. I will try to explain it one by one. All right, postbiotic. Probiotic, produce an array of inhibitory primary metabolites that are currently known as postbiotic. It has been proposed as a food supplement for healthier intestinal homeostasis and therapeutic aids in inflammatory bowel disease. This is reported by uh, Slingri in 2012. And we conducted a, a study uh, about seven years ago by Cho, and we found out there's a very high inhibitory activity. And if, if, if you look at this result, and this, this postbiotic derived from Lactobacillus plantarum from different strain of the, what, the uh, Lactobacillus, UL4, TL1, RS5, and etc. And we know that, I mean, this postbiotic, they play a major role as compared with the, what, the viable cells. And if you look at what this slide again, if we try to combine this postbiotic, and then we found out, and they have synergistic effect, they are even better than those postbiotic that use, I mean, uh, individually. If we look at what uh, this slide, this is another result just to show you what are the contents that are present in this postbiotic and we found out they contain quite huge amount of lactic acid, acetic acid and some other component that cannot be identified for example like uh, bacteriocin and some some other proteinaceous compounds as well. Of course not to forget this postbiotic they also contain some of the vitamin B especially the vitamin B complex and these are what the results that we obtained uh, so far just to share a bit especially the advantage of this uh, postbiotic against e coli listeria as well as the one the salmonella and we also tested in the vancomycin resi resistant enterococci and then we found out they have this kind of inhibitory effect against these pathogens i believe everybody will ask me 
how these postbiotic act. And probably, the, I, I, I like to share with you, okay, uh, to, I mean, especially the, what, the, the structure of this uh, postbiotic or the content, one of the content that present in the postbiotic. Normally, they have bacterial scene, as I mentioned it to you just now. Okay, this is the what the, the structure. They have the cation domain and hydrophobic loop domain. And then this structure is very important. If you look at what, just assume that, okay, when the animals consume this, okay, they are in the lumen of the intestine. And then when this postbiotic enter into the lumen of the intestine, and then this is the cell wall of the pathogens. And when this thing happen, this bacteriocin, later on, they will hook up on the cell membrane of the pathogens. And if let's say both of the bacteriocin hook up on it, and then they will start to open up the cell membrane. And then in order to let the, what, the contents in the cells leak out into the lumen of the intestine. And then later on, this will allow the organic acid and some other compound, H plus proton, enter into the cells. And then this will make the cells exhausted. And then when it made the cell exhausted, and then they will, try, they will start to excrete those uh, harmful material that present in their cells. And then later on, this will kill the whole cells in the intestine. All right, we, we have done, I mean, quite a number of the, what, the study, especially probiotic effect of postbiotic uh, produced by Lactobacillus plantarum, uh, which were verified in poultry, especially for the broiler chicken, as well as layer ham. And of course, not to forget about the, what, the uh, other animals. And these are the, what, the, the summary of our, uh, our findings, okay? They have inhibitory activities. And then, of course, they will improve the, what, the growth performance and improve the digestibility. And they have a greater villus height. And because, because of the, what, the, the benefit of this postbiotic, they will try to um, inhibit the growth as well as, I mean, inhibit the what, uh, increment of the population of the pathogens. And most of the pathogens is not able to anchor to the villus. Therefore, those animals that consume postbiotic, they have a greater villus height. This has been proven. And furthermore, I believe some of the, what, the people, they may think that probably because of the, what, uh, the postbiotic in the, in the gut, they may allow the increment, increment of the what, lactic acid bacteria in the intestine. And then this beneficial bacteria will be multiplied and then they will increase their population and then they will produce more organic acid. This will reduce the pH in the gut. Therefore, this also will reduce the fecal pH. As I mentioned to you just now, increase the, what, the fecal LAB count, that is bacteria. And indirectly, this also will reduce the enterobacterial cell count in the lumen of the gut. Recently, we also found out this postbiotic, they also will enhance the antioxidant activity. And we managed to, I mean, to, to share this result with some other people from, especially from uh, US. And besides that, we also found out they are able to improve the immune response and improve the meat quality. If you try to ask me, okay, what are you going, to, I mean, how are you going to choose? I mean, postbiotic uh, or probiotic, uh, if, if you look at what the, this comparison of the, what the uh, table, probably you will know it. Pro probability may not get, I mean, consistent result all the time. It depends on the, what the, the, the performance of the, what the probability use, especially in the gut. And do not forget, normally probability require a long duration in order to show positive result. However, postbiotic is not like that. And 
as I as I shared with you just now, if you look at what, if you still remember the timeline of the one, let the S bacteria, one of the what, uh, the important uh, component that I mentioned is paraprobiotic. And this paraprobiotic has been introduced in year 2011. Normally, they contain non viable microbial cells, intact or broken or crude cell extract, which present in this uh, postbiotic. That's why they call it paraprobiotic. And normally, when they, they try to administer into the uh, animals orally, okay, normally they will show positive effect. Sometimes they also refer as a ghost probiotic. And then prebiotic, as I, as I mentioned just now, is a non-digestible feed ingredient or a supplement that normally beneficially affect the host by selectively stimulating the growth of some or all of the non-pathogenic organism in the gut or colon. For example, like the common oligosaccharides that uh, we normally use, such as mannan oligosaccharide as well as fructo oligosaccharides. How, how is this prebiotic act? If we, we look at what the um, uh, prebiotic, normally we also know that, okay, they are food for beneficial microbes. Normally they will exert their beneficial effect on the host by selectively feeding the harmless bacteria, for example, like lactobacillus, thus improve their activity at the expose of the harmful ones. And normally prebiotic selectively fermented by beneficial microflora uh, into lactic acid. That's why this will reduce the pH in the gastrointestinal tract. And this will inhibit the colonization of pathogenic bacteria, for example, like E. coli, Salmonella, Crostridia, and others. And normally this, I mean, Salmonella, E. coli, and many other gram-negative the uh, harmful microbes are unable to utilize this oligosaccharide and therefore their growth will be inhibited. All right, look at what the short chain fatty acid like acetate and propionic that produce are having glucomyogenic effect while butyric is a major source of energy for intestinal epithelial cell. And those non-digestible oligosaccharides stimulate the absorption of several minerals like calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron. And they're also able to increase the immune uh, status of the animals. All right, the next topic I would like to touch, quite a number of the farmers uh, have been using it and, and they try to find a way how to uh, substitute the AG AGP in the farm, one of the, one, the, the common uh, additive normally they use is organic acid. Organic acids are short chain fatty acid and other carboxylic acids. Organic acid included in uh, the feed in order to lower down the uh, pH of the feed and gut. And I believe some of the, uh, the, the, the people they have read through before about this organic acid. The reason why we need to give this uh, organic acid because especially those animals which is not able to produce sufficient amount of hydrochloric acid, and then normally they, they will help the animals in order to convert some of the enzymes, especially the pepsinogen, turn it into pepsin, into the active form, and this will allow the animals to digest the nutrient well for example, like the protein. And at the same time, they also inhibit the growth of pathogenic uh, intestinal microflora, and they try to reduce the microflora competing for the host nutrient. And as I mentioned just now, they improve the nutrient utilization. This will result in better growth performance of the chicken. The most common organic acid used in poultry formic acid, propionic acid, lactic acid, acetic acid, malic acid, penzoic acid, butyric acid, fumaric acid, sarcinic acid. And quite a number of the, uh, the report has been claimed that 
the antimicrobial action of this organic acid, they are very similar to the, the postbiotic. However, they do not have the basic uh, bacteriocid. They just only have this kind of the, one, the undissociated form of organic acid that need to be penetrated into the cell membrane of the uh, bacteria. And normally in this uh, organic acid, they will change to the uh, proton and, and ion. And then this proton uh, specifically, they will decrease the pH in the cell as what I show you here. And then the bacteria use its energy to remove the protons and then they will die off. And ions of the organic acid deactivate the RNA transferase enzyme, which damage the, what, the nucleic acid multiplication and result in the death of the organism. And result is uh, as, as a result, they have a better growth performance of the chicken. And some of the what the, the people they say that blending of these organic acids or blending type or mixture of this organic acid have a better performance compared with the what? Single organic acid use. We, we also have been, I mean, I mean we, we proving that feeding of blended of formic acid, lactic acid, uh, malic acid, citric acid will improve the growth performance. And this result we have not published yet, but I mean, these are the findings that we, we obtain. And normally, I mean, the inclusion level is about one to 1 1.5 kilogram per ton of feed. And we, we, we also found, found out when this blended of organic acid uh, added with this palm fat, they will improve the growth performance better. And probably you can, you, you can read up from the Google Scholar and then try to download the paper that we published, I mean, before this. Organic acid, I mean, for the summary, organic acid as an alternative for AGP, I mean, normally as what we know, the pH reduction in the GIT through the diet acidification increased the nutrient utilization and inhibition of pathogenic bacteria growth and the effect of organic acids on the pH of the GIT is limited to the upper part of the GIT because these acids are highly absorbable and little amounts of the dietary organic acid may reach the lower part of the GIT. This is the, what the, the disadvantage of this uh, organic acid. That's why we need to further improve this organic acid in order to allow some of the pathogen can be uh, inhibited, especially at the lower part of the GIT. And then probably a protected form of the dietary organic acid need to be developed in the future. All right, the next topic I would like to share with you is phyto phytobiotic feed additive. I believe that quite a number of people, I mean, they've been using it by using the water plant, derived uh, natural bioactive compound that can be incorporated into the diet in order to improve the productivity, health and production of the life, livestock and poultry. And the results are very, it depends on their origin, processing and composition of the plant itself. And for your information, phytobiotics are approved in chicken feed in the EU, USA in year 2004. And phytogenic feed additive can be classified as uh, herbs, botanicals, essential oil, oleo resin. And those herbs, botanical essential oil, they have different kinds of the function. Some of them, they contain very high antioxidant activity. And some of the, what the, um, the people, they prefer to use the plants or herb itself. And as a summary uh, for these phytobiotics, normally they have this antibacterial effect, especially for the essential oil. And 
appetite, appetite stimulant, for example, like peppermint, lemongrass, and quite a number of the people, they claim that they contain very high antioxidant, for example, like tannin, uh, saponin, I mean, those are the what, very good um, uh, compound that present in the herbs. And then these are the few examples that um, I, I, I try to show you herbs that having antimicrobial activity, uh, cinnamon, cloth, black cumin, and then thyme, turmeric, and garlic as well. However, we have to remember these herbs consumed by human as well. Probably they are more expensive if, if we, we try to sell it, especially to the one, human for human consumption. And then the, the last one will be the batch fudge. And quite a number of the, what, the, the, the firms, they start to use this bacterial fudge. But recently I also tested this bacterial fudge in, in the chicken. I found out the, the results are not very convincing. However, I would like to share with you, uh, bacterial fudge are viruses that infect and kill the bacteria. And bacterial fudge control pathogens of GIT, which is protected from the E. coli salmonella infection in chickens. And then they are very effective in reducing the E. coli induced diarrhea. However, they, there's a limitation of this bacterial fudge are their specific specificity, ability to act as a vehicle for pathogenic genetic material, and depending on the concern of regulatory acceptance and practical routes of administration. For this whole summary, I definitely will support, yes, try to make use of the alternative for the uh, antimicrobial growth promoter, because this is the only way that we, we need to reduce, as what Dr. Rohaya mentioned just now, okay, especially for if we look at what the results of the antibiotic sensitivity, we know that quite a number of the pathogens they have, uh, they are resistant to antibiotic nowadays. And then we need to find ideal substitute for this antimicrobial growth promoter. And then it, it also has been proven to be beneficial in the outcome of feeding. And thank you. We welcome our last speakers for today is a Dr. Tan Chi Kiang, and uh, he is a happy guy. <laughs> He's going to speaking on the myths about the poultry meat and eggs. Uh, just want to introduce Dr. Tan. He's graduate as a doctor of a veterinary medicine from the University of Patania, Malaysia, 1992. He has been working in the poultry industry for past 28 years. Very experienced guy. He worked with the CP Group of Malaysia for over 25 years, a multinational company in livestock business with his last position as VP of a CP Malaysia, mainly taking care of a poultry integration business, feed, breeder, broiler, and egg sales operation. Two years, two years with CAB Group, a public listed company as well, and currently is a executive consultant for FLFA. So today my topics uh, is on me about chicken and eggs. So the definitions of means, uh, an ancient story or set of stories explaining the early history of a group of people or about natural events and facts. Uh, for this presentation, we are referring to a belief uh, but false idea about chicken meat and eggs. So we have two parts, right? Myth about chicken meat and eggs. So just now we listened to Prof. Lo, huh? all the details, how we produce chicken, what alternative, right? And definitely they will explain some of the myth or the general public uh, 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 perception about chicken meat. So we used to hear that uh, the myth, eh? The first one, branded chicken are free from antibiotic, but non-branded chickens are not. That means they're full of antibiotics. Right? But actually, the use of antibiotic is strictly regulated by Poison Egg Act. Huh? We have those rules and regulations to control. 
our government uh, since the British colonization. They have beautiful eggs to control uh, the chicken or the meat to be produced for human, for us to consume. Uh, so actually they are only used uh, theoretically on chicken affected by specific diseases and must undergo a withdrawal period before being sold. Just now we listen about AGP, anti -growth, antibiotic growth promoter. Actually, in actual facts in Malaysia, of the producers already, uh, already use, already use uh, those alternative, like those uh, probiotic, enzyme, prebiotic, uh, those, uh, 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 these, uh, uh, the uh, acid, uh, those organic acid. Uh, so actually, uh, the claim of being antibiotic free is only a form of quality assurance by the producers want to associate with his brand. Yeah, so they get, uh, they put the branding, better packaging, so they give more confidence uh, to the consumer. So, sorry. Chicken are vegetarian. Yeah, so some they claim that chicken are vegetarian. In fact, chicken are omnivores. Omnivorous, they don't really just eat grains. Chicken love, they love uh, worms, insects, spiders, lizards, are even frequently have been spotted eating rodents. This is in free range and you know, free roaming out, out there. This is their tidbits. They love it. Okay. But commercial feed may adopt vegetarian diet too. Deals the chances of pathogen contamination from animal based raw materials such as fish meal, meat, and bone meals. The third myth about chicken meat, uh, they claim that, okay, some believe, uh, they believe, it's just be dark chicken meat is more nutritious than white chicken meat, okay? So what is the white meat? Uh, usually we refer to the breast, uh, tenderloin, white meat, uh, the breast meat, dark meat, drumstick, thigh, wing, they consider as white. Okay, white or dark meat? Huh? Chicken is nutritious and an excellent source of protein. Uh, niacin, phosphorus, B6, uh, vitamin B6, B2, vitamin B7, iron, and zinc. So dark meat is richer in nutrients than white meat and contain more iron and zinc. However, white meat has fat and calories with higher protein content. The details actually we can search, right? But actually both meats are nutritious differences, right? So this is the nutritional comparison, right? So you see the calories, all this green is advantageous, huh? or this advantage depends on the requirement. Calories wise, white meat, Skinless, we compare to these two dark meat. Okay. They have less calorie, less fat, right? Less saturated fat, but more protein. Okay. But in terms of vitamins, B1, B2, right? Dark meat is better. B3. White meat is better. This B1, B2 is dark meat. B12, iron, zinc, and phosphorus go back to the white. So both have advantages. Ah, this is interesting. Okay, some myth. Eh? Myth. This is the myth that they say yellow skin chicken is better than white skin. Okay, yellow skin pigmentation actually comes from the feed chicken that, that are fed on feed containing natural pigment. Example, uh, xanthophyll will give more yellow hue than the one that does not. Okay, chicken skin is not an accurate measure of its fat content. Some believe yellowish means, oh, it's got a lot of fat. Uh, nu nutritional value and tenderness or even flavor. This is a, another one. They claim that frozen chicken 
are less nutritious than fresh chicken. Okay, but the actual fact, huh, the freezing process itself does not destroy the nutrients in meat and poultry products. The nutritional value of frozen and fresh meat is identical. It's no difference. Huh? There's only a slight, slight loss of protein content as a result of nutrient retention from the freezing process. But if you keep too long at the handling and the storage, that will make the difference. If a good process, good handling, actually there's no, no difference. Okay, frozen meat is generally more hygienic than fresh meat if cooked as soon as possible as it is kept at low temperature that slow down the bacterial activities on meat. Okay. Ah, this is a scare. Okay, we can get bird flu from eating chicken and eggs. Wow. Okay, actually Malaysia is free from bird flu or known as highly pathogenic avian influenza. Okay, so when you talk about bird flu, a highly pathogenic influenza, okay, we are free. We, are, we don't really have this except uh, for some minor occurrence which have been uh, contained by the Department of Veterans Services. Uh, our government, our DVS had made a very quick action to contain it. Okay, there is no widespread of HPAI. Some strain of avian influenza affect poultry only and do not infect humans. Eh? So HPI, if it occurs, spread in humans through contact with infected birds, their feces and the other body secretion. Well cooked, meat and eggs kill the virus if present and prevent humans from being infected. So well cooked food, no worries at all. Okay. So we come to the means of about eggs. Huh? For eggs, brown eggs are better than white eggs. How true is this? Brown eggs have same nutritional content as white eggs. So it doesn't matter you're brown or white. Okay, the breed of the chicken determines the shell color. Same like human, you look darker or what? There is something to do with the genetic background. Okay, the darker color on the shell is due to the pigmentation during the laying process and it's not related to the Equality. It's not that brown is better than white or white better than brown. Okay, neither. In fact, uh, white layer eggs, uh, layer hands, uh, lay more eggs than brown layer, layer hands. Okay, egg mass is the same for both breeds. Both breeds lay almost the same kilogram of feet throughout their life. It is the preference for most ASEAN communities that prefer brown colored shell eggs for aesthetic reasons. Okay, just preference. Huh? It's not based on nutritional. Okay, grade A eggs are better than other grade. Example like B, C and D. In fact, huh, in Malaysia, grade huh, eggs are graded by weight. Grade A eggs does not mean high quality eggs in Malaysia. Right? High quality eggs are characterized, characterized by A, Thick and firm egg white, yolk that are high and round. Eggs are practically free from defects and clean and free from cracks. Okay, these are the size, size A, B, C, D, 65 to 70, different 5, 5 gram huh? range. Uh, dark color yolk eggs are better than light color yolk. The color of yolks is dependent on the laying hen's diet. Okay, back to the hands. Hand fat on the food sources that are contain more carotenoid will produce deeper colored yolk. Carotenoid are yellow, orange, and red natural pigments huh, found in feed ingredients. Those feed or foods that have a yellow, orange, or red color, like corn, squaws, apricots, and even tomatoes. Huh? The tomatoes contain carotenoids. The chili red extract, huh, when fat, result in a darker color of the egg yolk. Next, eating eggs increase cholesterol level. Oh, this is a scat and worry. Everybody worry about cholesterol. You eating too much? <laughs> okay, eggs are low in saturated fat, in fact, right? Have no trans fat, okay? There's no trans fat in egg and only a small amount of cholesterol. Most of the fat in eggs 
is the good unsaturated fat that we need uh, for our health uh, to be healthy. Uh, we need to take this unsaturated, unsaturated fat. Some studies have shown that eggs consumption may even help prevent certain types of stroke and serious eye conditions called uh, uh, muscular degeneration that can lead to blindness. FDA, uh, USA, uh, has debunked the myth that eggs have high cholesterol level. Okay, the next one, eating egg white instead of egg yolk. Egg yolk and egg white differ slightly in composition. Egg white is a great source of protein, riboflavin and selenium. The egg is natural media for the development of the chicks and contain most of the egg's nutrients and nearly half of its protein. Of course, table eggs sold for consumption are primarily unfertilized eh? as the hens have not been bred. So don't get it wrong. Some people believe the eggs eh, that we get, we must have a male bird in order for the female to lay. Actually, it's not true. Female can lay eggs. They can go cycle okay, and produce, eh, ovulate eh, and produce eggs. So the next one, Kampong eggs are more nutritious than commercial eggs. Kampong eggs, those free, free range, eh? there's a little evidence on significant nutritional differences between organic, free range, free roaming kampong and standard eh? commercial eggs. Flour eggs from free range kampong eh? even may be contaminated with more diseases agent than commercial eggs. Food poisoning can occur if contaminated eggs are properly cooked. Eh? Those half boy, yeah, many love it. Eh? In Malaysia, in coffee shop, wow, they get half boiled. In fact, that is high. the only nutritional difference in eggs come from those laid by the hands with specific fortified fat diets such as omega-3 enriched, selenium enriched, and etc. Various claim from the enriched egg has been shown for fortified eggs with omega-3 or selenium. Okay, these are some facts on that. Okay. So in, 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 in summary, chicken and eggs uh, produced in Malaysia are good in quality and safe for consumption. The production is overseen by the Department of Veterinary Services, MAFI, or Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry. Uh, My Gap, uh, we have beautiful uh, program, uh, Good Animal Husbandry Practice, Animal Act, Animal uh, Feed Act, or Veterinary Health Mark, for chicken processing plant and the Ministry of Health eh, on poison egg, food egg. Yeah, and consumers should be aware of facts eh, rather than myths. So I think this is a time eh, for us eh, to let go of those myths. Okay, with that, there's some reference eh, if you are interested. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you. Oh, the first question for uh, Shizo Samuel, just curious, how antibiotic residue is detected in sorted poultry, and what level? Sometimes we have uh, obey the withdrawal period on the antibiotic, but somehow still don't pass AMR. Please enlighten us. So maybe Dr. Rohaya can uh, help to answer that. About Thank this. you uh, for the question. Uh, all the data shared uh, re uh, regarding uh, uh, veterinary public health index in my presentation were obtained uh, through our annual national sampling prog program in animal product uh, in the abattoir and processing plant. Few factors that contributed to the detected of uh, drug residue in slaughtered poultry uh, farm uh, there is a possibility of misuse or excessive uh, use of antimicrobial among the flock in terms of uh, purpose of the antibiotic uh, given dosage and regime. By right, the amount of antimicrobial use in livestock should depend on the number of animals, the production system, prevailing risk factors for disease and ability to acquire antimicrobial agent income. So, uh, 
and please not obey the withdrawal period of the drug use. So both uh, factor lead to detection of uh, MRL in the mid and this level of MRL is referring to the uh, table 15 of the Food Act 1983. I hope my answer. Yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you, Dr. Rohaya. You, you have answered that. And uh, uh, withdrawing period is a practice, is a, uh, what, what I can say, there is a practice of uh, farmers. So everybody have to practice that. Uh, this is a message to all the farmers that we need to follow um, the SOP being set by the DBS in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And we need to take care of the healthy food and we need to take care of the those SOP in order to produce a healthy food to the people. Of course, that DBS have done a lot of uh, tests and uh, for this AMR, uh, especially in the VHM plant, there's a reason that we I just highlighted that uh, the chicken being processed in the VHM plant will be safer to consume. And if you're having a chicken from a backyard slaughtering plant and uh, it, you, you might have a, a slightly concern of the uh, this antibiotic residue. All right, then we go for the, uh, seems like Dr. Rohaya, you are very famous. A lot of questions is referring to you. <laughs> okay, then we go for the next to, to you and I will jump to other, other panelists. So what, what may have caused the rise of a VP, VPH index in 2019 and a 2020? Okay, uh, uh, thank you for the question also. Uh, from the data, it reveals that increasing of uh, uh, VPH between 2019 to 2020 refers to the uh, violation of fail to meet the standard of indicator micro microorganism in food. So this indicated that uh, practices of hygiene and sanitation need to be improved along uh, the food chain, especially in the whole operation process in the abattoir and processing plan, referred to HSCCP in each uh, premises. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Rohaya. And I will jump to the question which referring to Dr. Professor Lo. So what about the use of uh, mid-chain fatty acids? Maybe Prof. Lo can uh, evaluate further for this. I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to, I mean, to share more just now during my presentation. Okay, because I think my, my slides uh, are a bit too long. And then that's why I, I would like to share a bit on this medium chain or what fatty acid. Normally when they, we, we talk about the medium chain fatty acid, Normally, they refer to C8 to C12. And then uh, those, I mean, carbon, carbon length, C8 to C12. And we, we actually, we, we studied this before. And then we found out they give a very good results, especially for the animals that consume this. And that's the reason why recently in POB, they try to encourage some of the, what, the, um, the planter I mean, especially dealing with the, what, the uh, refining of the, what, the uh, palm oil, and they try to produce this palm kernel oil because uh, normally palm kernel oil, they contain very high this medium chain uh, fatty acid from C8 to C12. And as we know that, I mean, they have this kind of uh, inhibitory effect, uh, exactly like uh, organic acid or postbiotic. And we also get, I mean, this kind of the, what, the feedback from the, what, the user, especially from uh, overseas. Uh, I think from Germany as well as from US. I, I'm not sure whether I answered the question or not. I, I, I believe uh, Prof. Lok have answered that. Maybe they want to evaluate more that we can answer throughout the, uh, by text. Then actually yep. they can test that and uh, they can uh, go for details. Of course, that, that you might be uh, able to provide some references to the, to the audience that are really interested in details. Yep. Thank, thank, thank you, Prof. Lo. And uh, one question for Dr. Tan. Hmm. Very interesting question. I, I, so, sorry to the floor, I just 
jump and pick some of the question that my uh, uh, all the panelists can participate in this, this Q and A. So, uh, oh, for the anonymous attendee, I, I don't know who, who are they. So, hi, Dr. Tan. Can you explain about this chicken meat and eggs? They are labelled organic. Wow, this is I want to know as well. How is the difference from commercial chicken? Okay, uh, when we talk about organic chicken in Malaysia, we uh, DVS do uh, have certifications for organic chicken, but uh, different country have different way of certifications and how extent how good is the organic is depends on is is different between country to country. Let's say in Europe, right? Or you, when you talk about organic, even the feed need to be organic feed. The raw material, the corn, soya, or even the wheat itself, you know, whatever you fed to the chicken should be organic. And, 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 and the price is uh, at least double to triple. Yeah, double to triple when you talk about organic. But in organic Malaysia, so we are, we are talking about you are not using any chemicals. Why well, Europe also know any chemicals, but feed we are not so, right? And some even they are talking until non-GMO, right? It's not only uh, 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 those uh, 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 raw material, the corn and soya is planted in organic way. It's organic feed as well as non-GMO. So that depends, huh? that depends. But Malaysia, I think uh, organic, organic wise, um, well, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. You have to talk about until the chemicals free or, or residues because a uh, 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 free range out there, we are under this, particularly under those plant, uh, this uh, palm oil, palm trees, huh? if they use chemical, you use herbicides or whatever, then it's not easy to, to that extent, right? Yeah. It depends how you define it. Yeah. Okay, thank I you. I hope you answered the question. I think you answered that. Uh, it's as long as it's labeled by the, 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 in, the, in the packaging and which yeah, certificate yeah, yeah. DBS, like Dr. Yes, Tan yes. mentioned that, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. of course, all, all the certification and accreditation by the DBS will be approved yeah. and uh, it's uh, considered as an organic product in the market. So, yes, yes. Uh, of course, in order to get the organic, the pits, everything, uh, DBS have audited, will be auditing basically. We are using non-GMO and the uh, premise has to be uh, organic uh, to let the chicken to live. And some standards that need to follow that my mind get, especially the minimum requirement. So thank you, Dr. Tan, that uh, so benefit to our farm produce uh, products eight. Boiler meat, pork, colour chicken, milk, milk, okay, milk, beef, mutton. What can and how the agro food do to enhance consumption of farm products locally? How, how, how to promote that? I think this is still many con consumers still naive about what they consume. Maybe, maybe they don't have this knowledge that what they are consuming. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, actually, actually, that is two, two, two questions, right? Uh, fake eggs, and then how to encourage people to eat more chicken. I think it's not here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, okay, maybe I start with uh, the, the fake egg first. Eh? Okay, actually, actually, uh, uh, in Malaysia, so far, we don't really see any true case of fake eggs. It's all rumors, right? And those experts, they claim there are no... You know, the yolk, you know, easily picked up. And it, no, no, that is a super fresh egg that you can pick up the yolk with your hand. Super fresh. Healthy chicken, super fresh eggs. That's been just laid within one or two days. You can take up beautifully and they are kept in a beautiful environment. So in Malaysia, so far, we are not worried about that. And I believe in future with all those good traceability, right? We have beautiful eggs, food eggs, animal welfare. Everything will come in, labeling, you know. I think this, this, uh, this thing, I think we can, we can, we can, we can solve and prevent. And, and you talk about how to encourage more consumption. In fact, I think Malaysia, we are one of the highest uh, chicken meat cons uh, 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 consumption country. Uh. Our per capita uh, consumption is already reached over 50 kg. Some claim 53 to 55 kg per capita. That's mean inclusive the baby. Uh. 
<laughs> average, right? So the adults uh, might have eaten uh, maybe 80 to 100 kg, you know? So, <laughs> so actually our consumption is high, but, but nevertheless, uh, we still can eat, we still can eat. Well, I think it, uh, being a Malaysian, we are very lucky. We have a big diversity of uh, 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 populations, uh, Malay, Chinese, Indian food, uh, sake of, we have, we have so many Western food. I think that, that uh, to promote, to promote uh, is definitely uh, to satisfy the taste bud of the consumer, right? So we have, uh, 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 still have uh, many room uh, to grow at this uh, food, uh, food sector, right? I'm talking about chicken meat, farming, and then until the processing, and then further processing, further processing until they're ready to eat. RTE, ready to eat. That means consumer just heat and serve. The food is cooked, you just heat and serve. I think that, that will promote further, right? So am I answer your the, the, the question, Gary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, this is, uh, we, we just mentioned, Dr. Tan just mentioned we are reaching the uh, quite high con con uh, consumption per capita, 50 something over kg. Maybe yeah. you are emphasized on the further process that my, uh, people can look for other alternatives instead of fresh yeah. chicken. Fresh chicken. Then yeah. the further increase the consumption of the chicken meats could be other products like ready cooked, like maybe some ingredients, nyongya, whatever, like uh, marinated, yeah. marinated or some uh, processed product nuggets, uh, sausage, you know, could, could be a tidbits like uh, they, they produce in China. So this is also the, the, the part of the uh, consumption of uh, chicken meats. So thanks for your info that uh, there's, there's, there's a reason that we need to promote the further processed industry in Malaysia. So this is how that we can uh, go for the next level of the process and we can earn, earn more income compared to other country like in Thailand. All right, I think we, we need to end the Q&A section due to the time constraint. Uh, before I ending that, I would like to thank all the speakers for your insight, pool sharing and variable discussion on the public health concerns in poultry productions. To summarize for today's webinar, according to the message from Dr. Dorohaya's presentation, firstly, we need to understand what is the food safety. All food born pathogens are expected to be zero as any food. Any food with antimicrobial residue AMR under drugs residue index, MRL, should be safe to eat. But she emphasized that MRL should be kept as low as possible in our market in order to provide more hygiene and more safety food to people. So that's, that's why people can always stay healthy and long life. Message from Dr. Yap for his presentation today. Understanding the environmental concerns in the poultry industry, awareness of these concerns and in implementing the sustainable strategies such as converting the conventional farming to modern farming and so on, especially to reduce and to avoid the waste issue to the society. Thus, we will create a healthy environment where farmers can live together with people in the same society. Lastly, we use a waste and go for green energy, such as a biogas plant. Proflow highlighted the organic acids as alternative of AGB. Uh, of course, that it need to take some time to readjust for farm management to use a prebiotic, probiotic in the farm. Now, but never say that we still can get a good farm performance uh, without the using all the uh, antibiotics as an AGP. Uh, very interesting from Dr. Tan, at least that uh, this uh, webinar, we can, uh, Dr. Tan, Dr. Tan can deliver his message to the floor. As chicken and eggs are good quality, generally are safe to consume. And uh, he highlighted that uh, color bird, white bird, white egg, uh, yellow egg, yolk, brown, uh, egg. brown egg. Yeah, sorry about that, uh, brown egg. Uh, they are the same, basically. And uh, yeah. So of course, that we need to make sure it's clean first, clean at the eggshell before you cook. Consumers should be aware of the fact rather than uh, the myths, and it is a time for us to let go for those. Before we end this webinar, I would like to thank our organizer, AFPN, FLFAM, and NPC, 
to our speaker, Dr. Rohaya, Dr. Yap, Prof. Lo, and Dr. Tan, who have given a valuable and informative presentation today, and especially to the MPC team who are helping and making our webinar successful, Chet Nadia, our MC today, and uh, Pon Safura and the rest of the team, team member. Lastly, to our respected audience to keep your valuable time and attend our webinar today, and we occupy another 20, 25 minutes maybe for this webinar. I believe today's topic are the most interesting and informative to private and uh, public sections. Okay. The next webinar on the 9th of December 2020 will be presenting the modern poultry processing. This will be the very interesting topics that will be very uh, practical. This will be the current hot topic being promoted by Malaysia government to go for this further product industry, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Our government have been looking into this industry seriously to produce good and safe safety food to people. And of course, that we need to go for the food security uh, from now and in the future. Firstly, to discuss the key points in the poultry processing for good safe and wholesome poultry products. Secondly, to explore the marketing opportunity for processed poultry products. So please register earlier and share your colleagues and friends to attend the next webinar. And now you can share the recorded video for this webinar and the previous webinar to your friends and colleagues as well. And uh, thank you very much that I will pass the mic to our MC today to end this webinar. Thank you, Mr. Terry Tan, uh, and all the panelists for the very informative sharing about um, our topic today. Um, stay tuned, the invitation will be emailed to all the participants today as soon as possible. And it has been a great day, Saturday, Saturday great day and a wonderful afternoon with all of you. Again, see you um, next week and goodbye. Thank you.